Welcome to the Starting Over Stronger Show, where you'll find help and hope for your divorce survival and recovery. Divorce well, live well. How is the other party going to react to this? What kinds of things and steps are they going to take? And how can I be best prepared for those? And so really understanding the military rights, understanding the divorce case process. Hey guys, welcome back to the Starting Over Stronger Divorce Survival and Recovery Show. It's my pleasure to meet you here each week with the assistance and support that you need as you face divorce. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast and shared a review on Facebook or here on your favorite podcast player, would you mind pausing this right now to do that? It helps us so much as we aspire to reach more women with this critical information at this important juncture in their lives. Your reviews and shares are helping us to help more people just like you, so thank you. Also, if you haven't already jumped over to the Starting Over Stronger website, please do that as well. I can brag on this gorgeous site because although it was created for me, it was not created by me. Nicole Ialeggio of NI Collaborations is a virtual assistant, which just means she knows her way around a computer and she works remotely to do the tasks that you can't or don't want to do for your business. She has been such a pivotal part of the launch of this show. She edits each episode to make us sound as good as she can, and we give her a run for her money sometimes, too. (laughs) And she designed this incredible website to help you find what you need as you explore how to get your needs met during your divorce. If you don't already know, divorce coaching is an emerging industry. It's been around for 20 years or so, but it's just beginning to expand into the Midwest here where I am. And the Certified Divorce Coach Program endorsed by the American Bar Association is helping to move this critical support service toward being more of an industry standard. And this does two really important things. It relieves attorneys, like the one I'm going to be interviewing today, from the burden of being pulled into being your all-in-all as you face the overwhelming demands of divorce. And it helps you feel heard as you explore your options with a thinking partner who understands divorce so you don't feel lost and overwhelmed the entire time. It really is such a blessing for those who choose to make the investment in themselves. I encourage you to check out startingoverstronger.com and just schedule a discovery call. It's my gift to you, and whether you decide to invest in coaching with me or not, you'll leave that call with more clarity about your next steps. Today, I am sitting with family law attorney Mandy Pingle, and she and I are going to shed some light on the subject of divorce as it relates to those who are in military families. Whether you or your spouse is the enlisted, Mandy has some critical experience to help you know what to expect and what to look for as you are divorcing the military. Hello, Mandy. Thank you for joining us. Would you first tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm happy to. So I've been doing family law, licensed about 15 years, working in the family law industry almost 20 years. Our firm gets involved and gets referrals frequently for high conflict or unusual kinds of family law issues. Of course, we love to settle cases and resolve them, but often when cases have unusual or difficult components, we get called in to try to assist people. And so one of those areas has become military law and all of the unique nuances that come about, both the acronyms that the military uses, the unique financial and parenting responsibilities that come with the military And so as a mechanism or an opportunity to help maybe serve some of our military members and their spouses who equally serve the military during their marriage to military members, I tried to really become well-versed in a lot of the military issues so that I could best serve our military service members and their spouses during a difficult time such as divorce. Awesome. Well, I know that we have a lot to cover, and we may not even get to everything on this list, but we're going to have a great conversation about how being in the military changes divorce on how it looks like on many different levels based on your list here. So let's just get started where you meet a new client, you learn that one or both of them are in the military, and I just want to start with where you start with them at that point. So 
Oftentimes, it's about education in the broadest sense in understanding, number one, what their goals are, what the concerns are, what the history has been, and then trying to develop a plan for how we're going to essentially take care of those issues one by one. And so one of the things I've experienced is for people when they come to my office and they're very stressed out and they've just either had a problem or they've thought through their decisions and decided that it's time to take the step of divorce, they're often in emotional crisis. They sometimes are in financial crisis. They don't know what's going to happen to their future, to their children, to their financial abilities. And so coming up with a plan is kind of my very first step because what I find, at least for my worries and anxieties, is if I know I have a plan to tackle them, they might not all be tackled immediately, but I at least know that there are strategies there to do that and it immediately reduces my worries and anxiety. So in the broadest sense, coming up with a plan and then obviously digging into more of the details. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. So I'm just going to go down your list here. This is a list of What kinds of things are different with regard to being in the military as someone approaches this from the perspective of divorce? So the first thing on the list is the Judge Advocate General. Yeah, so that's also known as the JAG in the military. And so I often get questions about how can the JAG serve either a military service member or their spouse in going through a divorce process? In the broadest sense, typically they will provide two kinds of help. One is for what they say general legal assistance. That typically means that they will help with letters, they will help with maybe negotiations or understanding or even giving referrals, getting you in the hands of an appropriate family law attorney. Our office frequently gets referrals from the Judge Advocate General and their office. So they will help with sort of broad sense issues. They will not help with detailed things like drafting documents, responding legally to pleadings, things of that nature, typically. The other large area where they will try to step in and help is by invoking service members' Civil Relief Act rights. That is a whole topic. We could probably talk for hours on that topic. But typically what that means is if a service member is tied up in their military duties, they have the right to invoke a civil relief opportunity to essentially put a stay on the case. That has obviously significant ramifications both for the service member as well as for the military spouse or the non-service member in dealing with and figuring out how to move things forward. So again, very important that you have someone involved in a military situation that understands those rights and understands how they can be used sort of as a sword or a shield for or against certain positions at certain times. Okay. And with some more specifics on the Service Members Civil Relief Act, what would you say are some of the things that they can expect to encounter with that? Sure. So if a military service member is unable to meaningfully participate in litigation because they are tied up in active duty, typically invoking the service member rights under that act will allow for a 90-day stay of the proceedings. And the idea with that, as most people would imagine, is if you're going to be going off to active duty, particularly if it's in a wartime or something like that, we don't want you to be worried that the spouse or other people are back home in the United States filing for divorce and taking actions against you. And so it's really meant to protect the military service member from having peace while they're off serving our country to know that they have the right to prevent action from moving forward without deadlines being run and things of that nature. However, it's not automatic. The court doesn't automatically know that a military service member is invoking it. They have to file something. Again, that can either be done through JAG or commonly it's done through the hiring of a lawyer, but then letting them know that you want to immediately invoke those rights. 
Of course, if you are the spouse of a service member that invokes those rights, there's a number of issues to deal with, as oftentimes there are concerns about financial support, child support, spousal support, what's going to happen for parenting issues while the case is on a stay. So again, lots of complicated issues that are related to that, but a very important right for both the service member and the spouse to consider. There's another act here that you've listed called the Uniformed Services Former Spouse Protection Act. What is that and how does that work? Yeah, so again, that is intended to protect spouses that are involved in long-term marriages with military service members to make sure that they are going to have certain protections as they look towards a divorce and obviously no longer being married to that military service member. So that's going to protect things like medical commissary exchange and theater privileges that military service members would receive. And again, I believe the military's motivation behind this is that if you as a military spouse put in 20 years of marriage and essentially you are supporting the military member and supporting the country and serving the country, so you are equally doing a service to the country you should be entitled to those privileges that are earned by military service members. There is a very specific rule, what we call the 202020 rule, and that essentially means that the former spouse has to be married to the military service member for 20 years at the time of the divorce or annulment, and the military member must have performed at least 20 years of service that is creditable in determining eligibility for retired pay And the former spouse must have been married to the military member during those 20 years of creditable service. So assuming you meet those parameters, there are certain benefits that are available as the spouse, including the things I've just mentioned. And essentially, you have the opportunity to have lifetime TRICARE military coverage. TRICARE is the military health insurance policy. However, former spouses also need to be aware that if they were to remarry someone else, they lose that opportunity under the military law. So if you marry someone else for a year and that doesn't work out, you don't get it back again after that. So again, they need to be careful and understand all of those opportunities that they have so that they can plan their financial future with as much knowledge and really the power of knowledge as possible. Awesome. Okay, so what are some of the effects of divorce on military benefits? So there's a long list. Again, we could probably have an entire conversation about (laughs) that. But some of the biggest things are what we call military members receive a basic allowance for housing, what they abbreviate BAH. And so typically within 30 days of a divorce taking place, the military service member loses their dependent benefits for those housing allowances. So that's one major impact. Um, Sometimes military members go through divorces while they're serving at overseas locations or they're serving away from, in essence, their primary or home state residential area. So that invokes issues of how we return a former spouse from an overseas assignment or how we return a former spouse to a location that they want to be. And so obviously there are issues of military moving costs, things of that nature. A military service member, unless they have met the 202020 rule we've talked about, is permitted to have up to 36 months of temporary health care coverage. It's similar to what some people know as the COBRA coverage, but it's through the military. So there are, again, time limits and specific things that a, um, an alternate spouse would have to do to invoke those rights. In terms of TRICARE coverage, health insurance coverage for children, they can typically be covered under the military policy through age 21 or 23 if they are enrolled in full-time college. And then the other primary thing that we look at is in terms of family support and making sure that the military, the military's payment processing center is called DFAS. 
that's the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, they must get copies of whatever family support orders are entered so that they can withhold from the military service members' pay. So again, lots of complicated issues that we could talk about for a long time, but that's just kind of a general overview or summary. Okay, good. And when someone is going toward the idea of filing for a divorce, is there something that they would need to know about where and how to do that? So there's lots of considerations for military members. Interestingly, in the Kansas City area, I'm licensed in both Kansas and Missouri. So, for example, we have the large Fort Leavenworth base here in the Kansas City area. Many of the military service members that work or go to the um, Army Command College on the Leavenworth base end up living over the river in Platte City, which is on the Missouri side. So oftentimes there are very interesting sort of metropolitan Kansas City area issues that touch military families. So typically the most appropriate place to file a case where children are involved is the state where the children are living. And there's something called the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act, which we abbreviate in family law, UCCJEA. And that just means the state where the children have resided and lived for the last six months is the best place to make a decision about the children's needs because that's where their school and their health care and their child care and other things and other people that would have information about them are primarily located. So usually it's going to be the state where the children and the family have been residing. However, military service members also are allowed to maintain a legal residence, and oftentimes that is not necessarily where they have been residing on a duty assignment. So sometimes there's considerations of using an alternate state, and there's pros and cons to that. In some military families, we also have a situation where if they've separated, one spouse is residing on the Kansas side and one spouse is residing on the Missouri side. So in some of those situations, there's an opportunity to file in either Kansas or Missouri. And so obviously being licensed in both states, I try to help either the military member or the alternate party analyze and decide based on the specifics of each state's family law code, which would be the most advantageous for their family and situation. Does the division of the military pensions factor into this at all? Yes, absolutely. So there's a lot of unique things that are related to the military retirement programs. In dividing the military retirement entitlements of the service member, we enter what's called a military pension division order, abbreviated MPDO. And the purpose of that is to let the military know that certain entitlements of the service member are being granted to what we call the alternate payee or the former spouse. And so within looking at the entitlements that the former spouse would have for military pension, there's something within that aspect called the 10-10-10 rule. And similar to our conversation a few minutes ago about the 2020-20 rule, the former spouse must be married to the military member for at least 10 years at the time of the divorce dissolution or annulment, the military service member must have performed at least 10 years of service that is creditable in determining eligibility, and the military member must have done those 10 years or more during 10 years of marriage. And so if you meet those requirements, then an order can be entered for DFAS to directly pay to the alternate payee or former spouse their entitled share of the military pension when it's in pay status. If the marriage does not meet those requirements of the 10-10-10 rule, the military spouse is still entitled to retirement pay. It just would need to be paid directly from the military member. So a couple of unique things about that. If we're in a situation where a military spouse is close to meeting those 10-10-10 rules, a lot of times we'll want to engage in a strategy where we make sure that the parties remain married for a period of 10 years to allow them to be entitled to have payment direct from um, DFAS rather than from the military member. The other thing that is unique about sort of looking at that rule is 
In terms of the spouse's entitlement, if you're getting close to the 10-year period as a military service member, you may want to think about going ahead and filing to move the situation forward so that the other spouse is not entitled to collect on the military pension directly from the military. In those situations where the 10 years is not met, typically we will look for another asset to offset against the military pension amount rather than putting the parties in a long-term scenario where one spouse is having to make direct payment to the other. Well, as an aside here, and you've mentioned a lot of different acronyms, and I'm sure that people listening, if they're in a situation with military, they may know these, unlike me. (laughs) Let's just run through a few here. You've got listed LES. Yeah, so that is the leave and earnings statement. That typically will include the allowances that the military service member receives, as well as their pay or income and their entitlement to leave or vacation pay. It's a really helpful document to us as family law attorneys to understand year-to-date pay, the military service member's rank. However, sometimes the leave and earnings statement will not show specific bonuses that a military service member either has received or is anticipated to receive. So in those situations, we will want to ask for a personal statement of military compensation. That is usually a several-page document that will outline all of the compensation that the military service member both has received and is anticipated to be able to receive. And the BAH? That is an acronym that stands for the Basic Allowance for Housing, or if the military service member does not elect to receive an allowance, they can also elect to receive quarters or living base, and that can either be on base or other arrangements made by the military. Again, that has a significant value, and that's something that is added to the value in terms of child support, maintenance calculations, and things along that line, added to the value of the calculation of the service member's income. And then the BAS. That is the basic allowance for sustenance. And again, it's another allowance that the military service member receives, which is considered in their overall income picture. And I think you mentioned this one earlier, the DFAS. So that's the Defense Finance and Accounting Service, and they are the ones that generate or pay out all of the military service pay, either for active duty members when they're receiving their paychecks or for retirement former service members when they're receiving their retired pay eligibility. Let's transition now to thinking about support allotments and how those are calculated. It looks like maybe initially service members are required to provide adequate support. What happens from there? Yeah, so initially, the military is very sincere in their desire efforts to make sure that family members or dependents of a military service member, so the spouse and children, are covered adequately financially. The military will not put up with a service member refusing to provide for the basic needs of their family members. And so initially, if a spouse of a service member needs financial support, there is a mechanism that they can reach out to the service member's chain of command to get some basic support in place. The fact that that is available is important for both the military service member and the spouse to be aware of because the military service member needs to be proactive in reaching out and determining appropriate support for their spouse and their children so their dependents to avoid communication to their chain of command, getting them involved in this. Because many service members put a high level of value on avoiding having their spouse or other people in communication with their chain of command, knowing that promotions and other things related to their career can be affected by allegations of not supporting dependents and things of that nature. And so then once ordered by the court, I assume then they have to have certain steps in place for that? An order of support is not entered. A spouse can either go to the military chain of command or they can work with the military service member to get appropriate support allotments in place. Once, however, the court orders a specific amount of maintenance and or child support 
for the military service member's dependents, including if the court determines that no maintenance is appropriate, for example, or that a military service member has primary custody of a child or children, so no child support is appropriate. Once that order is entered, that order becomes controlling and it overrides any determinations by the chain of command about appropriate support allotments. So again, in representing a military service member or the spouse, it's important to try to move quickly to get appropriate orders in place through the court based on the particular situation involved to allow for an appropriate order of maintenance and or child support as needed. Let's talk about any concerns that might come up regarding overseas living. Yeah, so this comes up frequently with military service members where they may get the idea that if they're stationed, for example, in Korea, that they should go to a local lawyer there in Korea, file for divorce, and they can get everything taken care of. The difficulty with that is that many states and many circumstances here in the United States do not recognize a foreign judgment or decree that's entered. So even when military service members are living overseas, they generally will need Need to look to the state of residence that they have filed for with the military and seek to obtain or go through the divorce process there. Our office has worked with many military clients and or their spouses from all over the world, in essence. And thankfully, with the modern inventions of Skype and doing video conferences, phone calls, email, scanning and emailing documents, military service members are able to go through a divorce process in their home state of residence without ever needing to leave the country where they're stationed at. And so frequently we get involved in situations where, for example, a military member is stationed in Germany or elsewhere and they need to complete a divorce in their home state of residence. What is the Uniform Code of Military Justice? So most military service members, I assume, would be familiar with it, as well as their spouses are frequently well-versed in what we call the Uniform Code of Military Justice, again, acronym UCMJ. And that is a general requirement for military service members in terms of their code of conduct, behavior, what is expected from them. And when they have violations of that, they are subjected to potential either discipline punishment, negative ratings on their service record, and or if it's serious enough, um, a potential court martial, which would seek to either imprison them, remove them from their duty, which could involve having a dishonorable discharge, things of that nature. So the important thing about this is that the military service member really makes intelligent decisions about ending their marriage. So, for example, one of the violations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice is having affairs within service member ranks. And so them choosing to have an affair is something that potentially could negatively affect their career. So knowing that, obviously, their smartest decision would be to not engage in those affairs. Once those affairs have happened, There's typically an effort through the family law process to mitigate that mistake on their part and try to avoid reports to the military service member's chain of command. And so that's something that happens frequently in trying to come to a resolution with the military service member's spouse in recognizing that both parties, meaning the military service member and the spouse, have an interest in the military service member retaining their career and their earning capability through the military so that the service member's spouse can continue to receive maintenance, child support, other sorts of benefits and entitlements, both for themselves and the children involved, that are necessary for the military service member to continue their military career. Yeah. And I suppose because of that, then it would be wise to exercise caution with regard to contacting the military members chain of command. 
Yeah, absolutely. I've had many situations where spouses of military members are angry and they want to make all sorts of allegations against the military service member. And certainly they have the opportunity and the right to do that. And there are situations in which we choose to do that and believe that it is the best situation to protect the family, protect the spouse, what have you. But there are also situations where there are behaviors and conduct that could be reportable, but in consultation with either the negotiations or understanding the risks and benefits, the service member's spouse makes a decision to not report those concerns in recognizing the larger benefits that could be acquired to them by ensuring that the military service member maintains their employment. Are there any other questions or considerations for a person to think about before they make that decision? Or is that more something you have to just address on a case-by-case basis? I would tend to say it's a very individualized situation. Each time that something comes up that either a military member or the spouse is concerned about in terms of violations, there's a range of potential discipline action that the military service member could face based on whatever the particular offense is. And so, again, there's times when it ends up being the decision of the spouse to make that report and indicate to the chain of command what has been occurring. But there are also many times and situations where in talking out the pros and cons, the spouse makes the decision to not make a report. I think what's most important in that situation is, again, that the spouse in particular, before making a decision to make a a report has well-reasoned legal advice, has thought through the ramifications, the pros and cons, and they've made a well-educated decision because many people going through difficult family law situations, their tendency is to be retributive, to act out in anger, to lash out, to try to get even, to sort of emotionally act out. And what is important to the spouse's financial future and well-being is that they make intelligent well-reasoned, calculated decisions about their future and not things in a moment of anger that could result in a really, you know, unfortunate decision or determination that affects both their long-term future as well as the military spouse's long-term future. Yeah, absolutely. Any kind of legal or coaching support through divorce, I think is that's the main focus, is helping people in that situation to decipher the emotion from the logic of the many different decision points along the way. And it's hard. (laughs) Absolutely. And that's a crucial area where someone like you that's doing the coaching could step in and listen to their frustrations and their anger and what have you. And even if you don't have the ability to give them legal advice about making that ultimate decision, hopefully be a voice of reason to slow down their desire to immediately lash out, help them think about pros and cons, and then if nothing else, have them be delivered about making a consultation with their lawyer or legal counsel Mm -hmm. to make that decision in a well-reasoned way rather than just making decisions sort of the act now and think later. And I know that one of your goals is to help them think now and then act as the time is appropriate. And that's where it's really helpful to someone like me in my role as a lawyer to know that you have that sort of day in, day out ability to provide that information and advice to them. Yeah. And just to prepare them for the conversations that they're going to have with you, I think makes them a more credible client for you because they're not bringing all that emotion with them. They've resolved that. They've worked through it. They know what the choices are and what decision they most likely want to make, but they come to you, I think, a little more reasonable yes, about absolutely. the approach. So yes. that's that's the goal anyway. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, when we think about the military retirement benefits, one we've already mentioned, and then there's a few more here. The military pension is the one that I think you mentioned earlier. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So another important aspect of the military pension is the survivor benefit plan, and Because everything in the military has an acronym, the acronym (laughs) for that is SBP. And that allows service members to buy a death benefit called a survivor benefit and allows the military service member to name a beneficiary in the event that they pass away, either through military service or otherwise. But the concern for the former spouse is that if they are entitled to 
a retirement benefit or a percentage of the military pension that the service member has earned, if the service member were to pass away, the spouse may not receive anything short of having it insured through the military survivor benefit plan. And the reason that that's a concern is that in many, many military families, the spouse has spent their entire years either raising children, raising the family, supporting the military service member's career, but oftentimes due to the nature of the number of relocations that are needed, the rigorous requirements of the military service member's career, oftentimes it makes it really difficult for the spouse to meaningfully build their own career. And so in situations like that, they often have spent a lot of their working years of their life not building their own individual retirement or pension or other retirement planning. And so it becomes really important that they have a share of the military service member's retirement. And obviously, it would be devastating to their retirement future if just prior to their opportunity to collect that, the military service member passed away and they were therefore entitled to collect nothing. So the survivor benefit plan is, again, a benefit through the military. It has a cost. Typically, it's six and a half percent of the overall retirement benefit that the military service member would receive. But the benefit of it to the spouse is that it allows their benefits that are received, their retirement benefits, to be fully insured. So, for example, if the spouse were to live 25 years past the service member, that small amount of cost for the survivor benefit plan would allow them to receive 25 more years of the pay status of the military pension without losing that due to the death of the service member. Okay. And then the other one mentioned here is the TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan, like a 401k? Yeah, so it's the military's version of a 401k. It allows the military service members to make voluntary contributions, and they can do that either as a percentage amount of their income or they can designate a dollar amount. But again, it's a really important aspect in family law situations. Sometimes the military service member and or the alternate spouse fails to look at that as a significant asset. And in some families where there's been many contributions for many years, it can be one of the most significant assets of the marriage. So just an important asset to be aware of and look at and consider in terms of overall fair property and asset division. Well, we have saved perhaps the most important part of this for the last year, and these are the unique issues with regard to parenting plans for military divorces. Yeah, so I think the major area of concern with this is just that you get a family law attorney involved in a military family situation that is aware of the unique issues that face military service members and or the spouses that are having to co-parent or parent with the military service members. So there's lots of unique issues that are addressed in military service member needs that maybe aren't present in the general population. Things such as military service members leave and availability. So it's really important that visitation be planned around their leave and their availability to exercise meaningful parenting time. So sometimes their breaks or Other times that they may have, particularly if they're prior to periods where they're going to be deployed or if they have leave upon returning from deployment, typically the courts want to give those periods a lot of deference. And again, in looking at the overriding best interests of children, they have a need to make sure they have a frequent, continuing, and meaningful relationship with both parents. So if a military service member is going to go on an extended absence or be unavailable to the children, then in their best interest, again, assuming that both parents are fit, we want to make sure that that military service member can maximize important bonding time with the child or children, both before and after their period of leave, so that the child can have those great memories, that meaningful time spent together as a memory during that period where they might be absent from the parent. There's obviously a lot of different factors that go into that as far as long-distance parenting when they are on leave, maybe even some kind of transportation and travel discount issues that might come into play there. 
Yeah, so many military families, particularly when a military service member is either on an assignment or if they're relocated to another duty station or something like that, they're interested in using military transportation. And so certainly families are able to do that. It provides really great travel discounts, but there's also a lot of considerations and logistics to think about that. It's not as sort of convenient or easy as booking a flight on a commercial airline. So again, lots of considerations and unique things to consider if a military service member, you know, wants to use those discounts that are available either in traveling to the children or in having the children travel to them. And if they are on long leaves, is there special considerations for visitation while they're away? You know, so Again, with the modern technologies that are developing, one great thing we have is the video conferencing. So whether it's FaceTime, Skype, or other ways, we really do want to look at ways that we keep the military service member connected with the children. And so looking at what those opportunities are, some families um, mail things on a regular basis back and forth. Some families um, have email accounts if children are older. So there's lots of different potential opportunities. It's just really looking for what those opportunities are and making sure that a parenting plan meets the unique needs of a military family. What about family care plans? Family care plans are generally required by the military prior to a military member's deployment. Whenever there is evidence or a history that the military service member is the primary care provider or has primary custody or shared custody with another parent after a divorce or if they are the only parent of a child. And the purpose is that if a military service member is unavailable, the military needs to know how to care for the children. So interestingly, in family law, family care plans are sometimes used as evidence in our family law cases to look at a military service member's history of completing family care plans and saying what did they anticipate was an appropriate care arrangement for the children while the parties were married. Oftentimes that involves obviously designating the spouse, so that becomes an important piece of evidence. Post-divorce, it's obviously important that the military service member understands that that needs to be in place. Typically, when the military is advised of a change in a military service member's circumstance, such as a new custody order being entered, a temporary judgment or order of custody, a spouse passing away or a co-parent passing away, the military needs to be and wants to be notified immediately. And then they require the military service member to submit a family care plan within 60 days of the notification of that change in status. Are there special protections if they have situations perhaps where the non-service member wants to deny custody opportunities because of military duty? Yeah, so the Service Member Civil Relief Act generally provides for some pretty broad protections. For example, in Missouri, there are some specific statutes or rules that say that a military service member cannot be denied custody opportunities because of their military service and status and that if a military service member is deployed, that the spouse cannot use the fact of their deployment to then seek to modify custody and allege, for example, that a military service member was unavailable for a period of six months, a year, or even two years, and saying, okay, now they're not as bonded with the child or children, and therefore I should get more custody. So there's specific protections that say, no, if a service member is serving their country and is deployed or at a foreign duty station and thus is unable to exercise the parenting time that he or she would like, upon their return, they're able to immediately resume that. And of course, I'm sure there's best interests in emergency circumstances that would override that if there's issues. Yeah, so certainly if there's an emergency circumstance, there's abuse of a child or there's something else, Um, there's an ability to take that situation to court and have the court address it. It's just as a general premise, the court wants to make clear that military service members can, again, have that peace of mind that they are serving their country and they're going to return and have their parental rights fully restored to them in the nature that the parties had initially agreed or the court had ordered without it being used against them that they're serving their country. 
Well, believe it or not, we made it through that whole list. So I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd love to give you the opportunity to just speak now to the listener and maybe that woman who's in this very situation and making that decision is hard. What would you say to her? I just think it's really important that particularly spouses, but military service members as well, that they be very intentional about making their decisions. And so when they are making a decision to divorce, one of the best things that they can have is the ability to plan and make the right decision for them. So I frequently meet with clients that are only in the stages of researching and trying to decide their options. And we have an entire meeting for what I call as pre-divorce planning. And so that's just getting your ducks in a row, thinking through how is the other party going to react to this? What kinds of things and steps are they going to take? And how can I be best prepared for those? And so really understanding the military rights, understanding the divorce case process, the biggest thing for either a spouse or a military service member is just that they understand what is at stake, what's involved, and how they can go through the process as intelligently as possible possible because, again, while being angry or acting out or lashing out at a situation or an occurrence or a hurt feeling or something else might feel good in that moment, it's not necessarily and almost never is the right and best thing for you personally, for your family, for your situation. So my best advice to people that are researching this and or going through this process are just that they need to be really intelligent and make the best, smartest moves that they can can make and take the best steps so that they're prepared to see their family's financial and obviously emotional future through and looking at the big picture of their long-term needs and where their family and their needs will be a year and five and 10 years from now, not what will feel good in the moment of today and tomorrow. Very good advice. And I don't know if you guys caught that or not, but if you are in the contemplation stage What Mandy just offered is, I haven't heard of it being widely offered with attorneys. Pre-divorce planning service has to be a very valuable thing for clients. It's a gift even if you do charge for it. We, we certainly, I mean, because as lawyers, our time is all we have to sell. So we do charge yeah. for it. But I find that for many people, it's probably one of the most valuable services that we can offer them, both in thinking through sort of the consequences of various actions, in planning for what do they need to do to get their ducks in a row to be prepared to go through the litigation process. And then like I tell everyone that walks through the door in my office, I tell them that just just because you've walked through the door to a divorce attorney's office does not mean that you have to be divorced or you have to see the process through. Mm-hmm. So for many people in doing that sort of pre-divorce planning, we end up talking about strategies to work through and fix problems in marriage. And I give them referrals to therapists or other marriage counselors. And we talk about how to both protect their fears about not knowing what the other person is doing, as well as to try to work on the marriage because many people have the goal of trying to work through and save the marriage. And so certainly nothing makes me happier or prouder than when I find out that someone I've given a referral for marriage counseling comes back and says, hey, we were able to work through our issues and we don't need your services anymore, Mandy. And again, I think a lot of that comes through being well-reasoned, trying to be smart and intelligent in a time of stress and distress to really think through what are my long-term goals for my family. And for many people that walk through my door, it is to get a divorce and proceed with the process. But then again, my goal is to help them be as smart and as intelligent and well-reasoned to get through the process in a way that both meets their needs and protects their interests, as well as thinks through the costs of both the high conflict approach and then thinking through a lower conflict approach in terms of how they can keep their costs down for the overall process. Because as I tell all of my clients, the less you spend paying me, the more you're going to preserve in your marriage estate that's going to be available for you and your spouse to either divide and spend or spend on your children. Mm -hmm. And so I would far prefer that my clients' money go towards themselves and doing something fun or towards their children, but not paying me for things that they don't need or for added costs because they're in an emotional or stressed 
point or position. Right. And again, I think, Annie, that's another great area where you serve them and thinking through making those intelligent decisions. Yeah, definitely. I work with a lot of people in the contemplation stage. And I don't know how other people view divorce attorneys and divorce coaches, but I could certainly see where someone could make the allegation that we capitalize on a bad situation. But I think it's exactly the opposite, that we provide a much needed service for people who are not able to restore a marriage. And we can do that with a clear conscience because we don't ever try to talk anyone into it. We, in fact, make sure that they're making a decision that they're not going to have regrets about. So Absolutely. It's, yes. it's a very important service. And, and I'm glad that you were here today to talk to us about bringing light to how these perhaps cloudy issues in military families are affected by divorce. So thank you again for being here. Listeners, if you have additional questions for Mandy Pingle, how would you like them to get a hold of you? So they're more than welcome to reach out to my office. My office email is team, T-E-A-M, like a football team, at KC, like Kansas City, KC familylaw.net. Our website address is www.kcfamilylaw.net, or they're welcome to call my office at 816-891-9393. Okay. And if you missed any of that, you can always reach out to me at annie at startingoverstronger.com. If you do reach out directly to Mandy, please let her know you heard her here on the Starting Over Stronger show. Just a reminder, please like, follow, and review Starting Over Stronger on Facebook, Instagram, and your favorite podcast players. And then go visit the startingoverstronger.com website to learn more about coaching, groups, and the podcast. Remember, wherever you are in the divorce process, we are here with help as you divorce and hope as you are starting over stronger. Stronger. 